certainty of life after death. Now, Houdini had one very important thing right, and it's this. You cannot communicate with someone after they die. Okay, that is not true. I uh, was just talking with Gary about our uh, psychic that uh, resonates or lives or resides or whatever on Timberlake Road. For a while, it seemed like there was going to be no psychics because the house was bought and now it's being transformed into something else. But now it's even closer to the church. Um, so I don't know, maybe we on our uh, outreach nights, we need to go and visit this person. I mean, I'm down, okay, to do that. Um, that actually sounds like kind of fun because it would be an, a very interesting conversation. But you cannot contact someone after death. They cannot contact you. The only time in Scripture that we see this happening is when Samuel uh, is conjured in whatever sense by Saul and the witch of Endor. And even there, the witch is surprised. She's like, oh no, we actually did it. Which, of course, is a feature of God's sovereign plan to say, don't do this. You are doing it wrong, right? Proving, furthermore, that Saul is not the king, right? That David is the rightful king because he's the one who seeks after God's heart, not dead men, okay? So all the, all the hullabaloo that we hear about this, who didn't he had right about that, right? People who promise to, to have messages from your loved ones are con men and shysters, right? They, they're not telling you anything Right, but what Houdini had wrong is there actually is life after this one. In fact, it's the more important life because this life allows you to obtain by the grace of God and is calling you out of darkness into marvelous light, real life, true life. In fact, that's how he ended 1 Timothy 6, right? That you might take hold of that which is life indeed. And so now Paul, having been released from prison and then back into prison... He apparently is in Rome, and he's writing at the very end of his life, expecting to be martyred for his faith, and he is going to talk about the promise of life. Because there is nothing more precious in the face of death than the comfort of the gospel. I don't know how many times I've heard people say, I don't know how I would face death the grief of a loved one or whatever, if I did not have Jesus. And how of a true of a statement that is, right? If there is no promise of life beyond this moment, what in the world are we doing? Why are we doing it? If life is just a means of random chances and synapses in your brain and it's all for nothing, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? That's why Paul says, if Jesus is not raised, then we are to be pitied above all men, because we are fools indeed. But the truth is, the truth is, Jesus has been raised, that he did die for us, that he did love us supremely as we sang, and he holds out to us the promise of life. And so these are the precious words of a dying apostle to his protege to say, keep going. Stick with it. The world is crazy. People do not seek after God, but stick with it anyway. Follow me in my example. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I am waiting on the promise of the crown of life. That's what he's going to say in chapter 4. And so this is Paul's own example as well. So we are really picking up where we left off. Even though there is a great deal of, a decent amount of time in between 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. A few years at least. The content really flows one into the other. Because where he left off to telling Timothy, guard the deposit that has been entrusted to you. Is exactly what he's expecting Timothy to do. Because Paul is moving on right he's going from earth to heaven and he will not be around anymore and so what is timothy to do the same thing that he has been doing right he doesn't need novel things novel theology novel teaching he just needs to continue in that which he has learned from the beginning and that's what he's going to tell him several times over so the key idea i want you to get a hold of today and really throughout the book is this the gospel is the most important message ever given that's what we had last time and so we said it must be preserved and protected and passed on but if it is the most important message ever given it will change everything 
both in this life and the next. Which is why if you believe the gospel, you have everything in Jesus Christ. But if you disbelieve the gospel, you have absolutely nothing. Because in Jesus Christ is the promise of life. Not in money, not in wealth, not in wisdom or power, or any things that we sing about, right? It's not in any of those things. All the things that the world chases so hard after, power and position and prestige, they don't amount to anything. When a great man of great means dies, guess what? He goes into the ground where all the other people who have died also go. He didn't take any of his fame. He didn't take any of his power. He didn't take any of his money. You know what he took? Dust. Isn't that what God says? From dust you came and dust you shall return. So what is the key? The gospel is the key. That it is the message that brings life from Jesus Christ. Which means it's worth enduring for. But of course we must really believe this. We have to have a real conviction in order to live like that. In fact, the harder it gets for Christians to live Christian lives, the more precious the gospel will be, but also the greater the dividing line will be. Why I lament that our culture has moved further and further and further away from common decency and Christian morality, there is a goodness to that in the sense that those who really believe have to prove it. Because it's going to cost people something to actually say, I believe in Jesus. 30, 40, 50, 75 years ago, you could be a Christian, so-called, and not really have to sacrifice a lot because everybody was just kind of doing the same thing. But now, guess what you have to say? Things like, I'm sorry, but a man cannot be married to a man. I'm sorry, but it's wrong to kill babies. I'm sorry, but you don't get to choose the words that describe who you are. I'm sorry, truth is truth. It's not yours to possess. It's God's to give and yours to obey. Things like that. People don't like things like that. But they're true and they're necessary. Because if we're going to live in light of the gospel, we must do so understanding that we don't get to change it. We don't get to massage it or warp it or water it down we must be people who hold it in trust it is the most important message ever given and if we truly believe it if we are willing to say it is preeminent then it will change everything about this life and the next one so this is going to be the same thing guard this deposit this will run through this letter. Now, this letter is vastly different than 1 Timothy in its tone. Now, this doesn't mean that 1 Timothy wasn't important, right, or anything. But in this letter, Paul is going to get much more personal, right? Which is normal, right? When you approach the end of your life, you start thinking about things that matter, like the people that you know and the memories that you have and what you hope they do when you're gone and that kind of thing. And so this is essentially what Paul is doing. There's a lot more tenderness and personal nature to this letter. But there's also a sense in which Paul is like, look, this is the kind of things that are going to be important when I'm gone. So you really need to listen. In fact, he's going to begin like this. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. So he begins the same way that he began last time by reminding Timothy of his position. Not because Paul is great, but because Jesus is great. And whatever Paul has been telling Timothy is what Paul learned from Jesus. Right? This is going to be present for us, especially when we get to chapter 2 where he says, Look, all these things that you've been hearing, you need to entrust them to faithful people who will then also teach others. Because Christianity is not something that gets invented by man. It gets revealed by God and passed down through the ages. Which is why I told you last time that what we do in guarding the gospel is not merely about our salvation, certainly it's that, but also about those who come after because if we get it wrong, they're going to have a lot harder time getting it right. And if they're in a worse world than we are, that's going to be even more difficult. 
So we have to be clear, we have to hold on to that which has been delivered because it has been given by the very will of God. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. Right? So Paul is trying to give us this sense of urgency and authority to say, look, this is important. It's important for Timothy and for everyone who will come after. Because the apostles are passing from the scene. So what is going to be left? There's not going to be new revelation. There's not going to be new miraculous gifts. There's going to be what they left behind. Which is, of course, the very word of God. I think Paul is very cognizant of the fact that he is giving scripture. Because by the time he gets to chapter 3, he's going to say, Look, all scripture is breathed out by God. What does he mean? These things I'm writing to you, what Peter wrote, what John wrote, what Luke writes. Look, take these things and hold on to them. Why? Because in Ephesians, which remember, Timothy is in Ephesians, in Ephesus. He's there in 1 Timothy. He's here in 2 Timothy. He's supposed to be coming to Paul at the very end of the letter. We don't know if he makes that trip or not. But in Ephesians, he writes that the church is built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets. So how do we know how to follow Jesus, how to live for him, how to work as a community? Well, it's in the word that these people left behind. We don't need to seek out new things. We need to hold on to what we have. Again, this is not in vogue in our day. We value the novel and the different and the new. But some new things are bad. Right? And some old things are bad. But what never is bad is the revelation of God to his people. Now, in this first little section here is the address of Paul. Right, This is a pretty normal way to begin a letter. We have the sender, the recipient, and then the next section, which we'll cover next week, is a thanksgiving, which is pretty normal. Now, in 1 Timothy, he, he didn't talk about a thanksgiving, but in 2 Timothy he does, which is perhaps partly because of this personal appeal but he says paul an apostle of christ jesus there it is same thing that he did in first timothy with fronting christ before jesus which i think calls attention to jesus's nature and salvific work uh, while also of course bringing into to the fore his um, humanity as well so paul an apostle of christ jesus by the will of god so this is not an accident according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. We're going to focus on that in just a second. To who? To Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus or Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we have here this opening. Now, first or 2 Timothy here, as I said, is kind of Paul's swan song, his last will and testament. He is going to give a, a series of kind of... Um, charges to Timothy that are roughly akin to the way that the chapters break down. So, for instance, we have this opening with a thanksgiving through verse 7 of chapter 1. This is followed by an exhortation for Timothy not to be ashamed of Paul, who, of course, is in prison and seems to be on the down and outs, but, of course, is really suffering for the gospel. And so then he's going to give him three metaphors by the time we get to the end of chapter 1 and chapter 2 that showcase what really living faithfully is about, the soldier, the athlete, and the farmer. Then he says, look, there's an important lesson here about the proper uh, nature and actions of the Lord's servant. This is going to be in the beginning of chapter 2. And then he discusses the gospel, talks about a trustworthy saving, uh, saying, and then three more metaphors of Christian ministry, the worker, the household instruments, and then the servant again. This gets followed up by talking about latter-day apostasy. This is chapter 3 where we talk about men go from bad to worse. And this gets wrapped up in a final solemn charge to say, look, preach the gospel, preach the gospel, preach the word, in season, out of season. People don't want to hear it. They want to hear words that tickle their ears, but you've got to stick to the gospel. And this just gets wrapped up at the end with a little bit of news, Paul's request for Timothy to come, and then a final greeting where Paul is going to say, look, I have finished the course now it's entrusted to you so this is the general thrust of the book so chapter one is about guarding the gospel for instance in chapter one verse 14 he says guard through the holy spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you chapter two he's going to say suffer for that gospel for instance verse three suffer hardship with me as a soldier of christ jesus or verse eight remember jesus christ 
risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel. Or verse 9, for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not in prison, because the gospel cannot be bound. Chapter 3 is going to be about continuing in that gospel. For instance, in chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. But evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that's the key, right? You must have a true conviction. You must be convinced down to your very bones that the gospel is true, that Jesus is real, that what he says is important, because if not, you will give up. Then we get to chapter 4, and he says, look, proclaim that gospel. This is what I just said a while ago. I solemnly charge in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready, in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. So this is the thrust of 2 Timothy. So let me give you a few things here as we look at the introduction to this letter. And and I said, specifically we're going to focus on this idea of the promise of life in Christ Jesus. So the first thing is this, 2 Timothy is indeed Paul's farewell letter to his foremost disciple. This is, of course, just trying to bring into the fore that Paul writes it to Timothy, who is, without doubt, his closest and most trusted uh, disciple. Now, Titus, of course, is up there. He's also sent to various places in this way. But Timothy seems to have a special place in Paul's life and in his ministry. And so he's using Timothy to translate this uh, concept of passing on the gospel, enduring with it to... Timothy and all the successive generations of believers as well. Now, as I said, last words are important words. And so this is what's really on Paul's mind as he approaches his death. So the end of Acts, right, we see Paul in prison in Rome. But that is a very loose sort of imprisonment. He's chained to the praetorian guard. He's preaching the gospel to whoever comes. Now, he's not without difficulty. But it's very different. This imprisonment that Paul seems to be in is much more dire. As it says that he is treated as a criminal. And we know that Paul is imminently to be uh, persecuted and then killed for his faith by Nero. Right? He is, uh, according to tradition, be, uh, beheaded because of his commitment to Christ and his willingness to preach the gospel. And so Paul is, as he said, being poured out as a drink offering. Which is a particularly poignant metaphor and description of what it must mean for him as he approaches his dying uh, moments. Now, what's interesting in this is that Paul's last words are not like, hey, do all this stuff for me, which is what we tend to think about, right? When you come to the end of your death or end of your life and you're thinking about death, a lot of times what we think about is, what do you want to do before you die? Which is a question about you. Paul, other than the fact that he says, bring the books, which is right in my heart, right? He says, bring the books, because that's the most important thing to have when you're dying is books, right? Um, where's Brandon? Brandon, where's he at? Am I right? Right. There we go. And his coat, because he's cold apparently, right? He's in a deep, dungy prison. We're talking about a little bit what this prison was like as we go through uh, this letter, right? It's uh, essentially a hole in the ground. And when it got time to kill all the prisoners in the hole, unless they were to be publicly executed, they would flood the prison with sewage, and then you would die, and they would wash you out, and they'd put 30 or 40 more prisoners down in the same hole, and then the process is just repeated over and over. Right? This is not a good place. There's no bathrooms. There's no, not even porter potties, right? There's none of these kinds of things. It's terrible. It's dim. It's dark. It's gross. Right? This is not where you want to be. Not only that, Paul is also saying, look, I've been deserted. No one is with me other than Luke. Now, some Paul has sent away on uh, missions, right, to help churches. But others, like Demas, has left because of his love for this present world, right? In other words, Paul feels deserted. So not only is he approaching death, he feels deserted. And so what does he do? He says, look, Timothy, come help me. No, he says, Timothy, suffer with me. Do the ministry of God with me. Hold on to the gospel with me. In other words, what I'm saying is, in Paul's last words, he does not lament his situation. 
He glorifies Jesus. Which is vastly different than how we tend to approach death. Because death makes us introspective, but for Paul, death makes him heavenly minded. Now, no doubt, Paul is comforted by the fact that Jesus has the promise of life for him. But what is he doing? He's like, look, there are people that are going to need the gospel, the same message that frees them from death and gives them life. Be about that. When I come to the moment of my death, I want to be like this. In fact, I have contemplated writing out a sermon so that whoever the preacher is just reads what I write because I don't want somebody to get up here and say, oh, how great Chase was. Forget about all that junk. I want people to hear, Jesus Christ came to save sinners. Do you want to believe? If that's the only words that are spoken at my funeral, I will praise God because that's what matters. Now, I do hope that people can say nice things about me. But because Jesus did something in me. Because, as Paul says, apart from Christ, I am the foremost of sinners. And so are you, by the way. So is everybody. Because we all need the same thing. The promise of life that's found in Jesus Christ. So Paul is without doubt an important man. But not because of his own self. But because of Jesus' work. By the will of God. Right? So this appointment to an apostleship is first off outside of the norm. Because he's not one of the twelve. It's as one untimely born, as he says in 1 Corinthians 15. But it's not because of a church. It's not because of any man or even from his own self-appointment. Paul is doing this work because God has called him. Which means that we ought to listen to Paul because he occupies this special place. We ought to imitate him because he's following Jesus. But also, each of us has received some responsibility from the Lord. If we're a father, then we have a responsibility to our wife and to our children. If we're a mother, we have a responsibility to our husband and to our children. If we're a grandmother or a grandfather or whatever we are, God has expectations on our life. And we will answer to him as Paul seems. No, I think he he not only talks about this because he's trying to say, Timothy, listen to me, but he's saying, look, I am under obligation I will give an answer for what I did with what God entrusted to me and I want to be found faithful friend it is no small task to be a dad or a mom or a worker at a job or whatever God has given each of us something to do to glorify himself and we don't get to just say, oh, I don't really care about that. No, we are done. We do those things by the will of God. Because he is entrusting these responsibilities to us. We sometimes forget that the mundane things of life are perhaps the most important callings of God. Because we spend much more time every day folding laundry and cleaning up poopy diapers and all that kind of stuff than we ever do doing most of the other things. But those are the things that make the most difference because they accumulate into the greatest of all. In fact, I remember a few years ago, I was doing these things called Family Fridays, and this was like a every Friday I did a little video on Facebook, and I talked about the glory of the mundane. Because we tend to think about the great things. Oh, well, when we went to that camp or whenever I got that big promotion or whenever we went on that... A uh, trip to this place. And sometimes those things are important. But most of the time, what we do day in and day out, trying to fulfill the will of God, do what he has called us to do according to the scriptures, those make the most difference in the end. In fact, I challenge you to think about some of the most impactful memories in your life, especially with respect to maybe what your parents did. Now, you may be able to remember a trip here and there, but I would venture to guess that most of the time you remember some off-the-wall random thing that your mom or dad did that made an undying impact on your life. And it wasn't something they planned. It just happened. Hopefully they were faithful to the Lord 
and it did make that impact. So 2 Timothy is Paul's farewell address to his foremost disciple because he's trying to give him important words before he dies to pass these things on. But number two, Timothy Timothy marks the transition from the apostolic period to the post-apostolic period in which believers are commanded to guard the good deposit. This is what we see in verses 12 and 14 through 14 in the first chapter. So he says, For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard that which I have entrusted until that day. We have a song about that, right? Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. This is the program for the church after the apostles leave. In fact, it's really the program throughout, but especially then, because we will not have people giving us revelation from God anymore. They already gave it. Our job is to keep it, hold it, protect it, pass it on to everyone that we can. So, as I said, there is no more revelation to be had. We have everything needed. As Peter says, right, God has granted to us everything necessary for life and godliness. Most often what we do is neglect what we have. As I told you before, right, we live in a day and age where we have more access to knowledge, and in particular, biblical knowledge, than has ever been had. Now, as you know, I've told you I'm a nerd, and I enjoy watching uh, Jeopardy. And recently, there was a, a biblical category on Jeopardy, this was a few weeks ago, and not a single contestant got a single Clue. And Bible com, uh, categories are pretty common on Jeopardy. And I always tell Melissa, if we're watching, I'm like, I would bet it all. Because a lot of times, they have the Daily Double also in the Bible category, which I feel like is a little bit of a poke in the face, like, y'all don't even know this. But I'm like, look, if I had 10,000 points, because you don't actually have dollars in Jeopardy, you technically have points, um, by the way. You, then you double it, right? Let's double it up. They didn't know a single one. See, most of the problem I think that exists in our society today is not just that we have bad morality. It's that we have lack of Bible literacy. People don't even know the basics of the Bible. And so how can we possibly expect them to do what it, it expects because they don't even know what it says? Which means what? Usually the answer is, well, we're going to put the Bible back in the schools. That will be tremendous, but friend, that ain't happening. What does it mean? It means you and me developing a relationship with our neighbors, talking to them about Jesus, and saying, hey, man, you want to read this book of the Bible with them? They're probably going to say no. And you're like, that's all right. I'll just quote it to you anyway. Which means what? You better know what it says. Better know what it says. See, here's the real scandal of biblical literacy. Is it's not really a world problem. It's a church problem. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But friend, when's the last time you read the Bible all the way through? When's the last time, other than 1 Timothy, that you read an entire book of the Bible all the way through? Friend, when's the last time... You read a verse that wasn't in a devotional printed at the top of your page. You see, if we want to be people that hold on to the deposit, the good deposit, we must be people of the book. Baptists have a history of that. We used to say that. We're people of the book. But are we people of the book? Are we people that say we're people of the book? Because that's not the same. Because people that are really people of the book change. You see, that's the real thing about the word of God. Is that if you read it, if you work through it, if you study it, if you try, it's going to change you. Which perhaps is why we don't like it. Friend, I'm telling you. One of the great privileges of being the pastor of Lakewood is that I get to spend hours every week studying the Bible. 
One of the most painful things about being the pastor of Lakewood Baptist is that I study the Bible for several hours every single week. Because every time I read it, no matter what, every time I'm like, I am a horrible human being. What am I even doing? But then I hear the voice of Christ, not literally, right, but in the scripture, God's grace is sufficient for you. You see, this is what the word of God does to us. It stings and then it comforts. But you got to get in it to know it. So this is Paul's way to say, look, I'm moving out. You're moving in. What do you hold on to, Timothy? Guard the deposit. How do you guard it? Well, he's going to say guard it through the Holy Spirit that dwells in you, right? What does he mean that every single person who has the Spirit has the ability to understand what God says? In fact, that's usually one of the things that people say whenever you say, you should read the Bible. They say, I don't understand what it means. And then I say, pray. Because what's the answer? Ask God to reveal what he has written. Now, do we need teachers that can help us? Absolutely. But really, most of the time, we just have to try and then ask the Spirit to help us. Because as we're going to discover a little bit later on in chapter 2, consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. He's saying, look, Timothy, listen to what I say, and then ask God to reveal to you what it means. So you have within you already everything needed to understand the word of God. So our problem, as I said, is most often not inability, it is neglect. In fact, that's what uh, Justin Peters usually says, the word of God, or the will of God has never been lost, it's only been neglected. Because it sits on our shelves collecting dust. Now this is where I really want to get to is... Number three, 2 Timothy is about living now in light of the life to come. So what does he say? Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. Now this idea of the coming life, the the promise of Christ, this eternal life to come, this dominates the letter, which is rightfully so because Paul is facing his imminent death. But this becomes particularly special to Paul because I think he feels not just its weight, but also the need to to say, look, this is where everything uh, comes together. This is what everything is about, the life that is found in Christ. So three things here. First is this. Jesus has promised a life that is beyond the present world. Which is important because what does our world say? Look, everything that you want is here right now. The world tells us a lie that our lives are primarily about what we can do and what we can get and what pleasure we can have right now. The Bible says it this way, right? Those who say, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's what the world says. Look, your life amounts to nothing. You're not special, even though they pretend you are. You came from random chance, right? Evolved from a monkey or whatever. And so you might as well just seek whatever you can get now because there's nothing to be had later. Which is particularly ironic because most people who live that way are terribly afraid of death. Because here's what is the inescapable fact, people. God, and Ecclesiastes says, has set eternity in the hearts of mankind. From within, we condemn our own selves knowing that really there is something more. We just don't want to acknowledge it. Because if there is something more, there must be someone who has made something more. If there is something more to be had, then how do I get it other than to get it from the person who made it? That is, life everlasting. And so the world is confused and conflicted about this because on the one hand, it wants to deny the life that it clearly feels that is after this present life and tells us, look, just do whatever you want now. But this is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that this life is the prelude to the next one. That there is real life, eternal life, eternal existence that follows this one. And you will either end up in one of two places. You will either end up with Christ in heaven forevermore, or you will be consciously tormented in hell 
hands of God's wrath forevermore. And so this makes and matters the utmost. Now notice what he says. It is a promise of life, which means it is something that impacts now but is not fully obtained. So we have abundant life, John 10, now, but we have not received its fullness until then. And a promise is particularly important because a promise is something that can be banked on, especially if it is a promise from God himself. Because what God promises, he always performs. This is Romans 4, right? That Abraham hoped against hope that what God promised, he would perform. This is exactly what we do as well, having the same faith as our father Abraham. That what Jesus promises, he certainly brings. Because a promise from Jesus, who has risen from the dead, is so certain, as we talked about before, that it can be talked about in the past. It is not in question. But it is something that we have to wait for and believe in. Which is why the Christian life is from faith to faith. Now, one day, our faith will become sight. Praise to God for that. But until then, we walk, live by faith. Believing in the promise. The promise. Now, what is the promise of? A promise of life. That is, life that is truly life. That is not beholden to the specter of death. This is the life that we all need because we are dying sinners. So notice what Jesus does. Look over. At verse 10 in chapter 1. So he says, But now, he's talking about the grace which is granted in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death. So what does Jesus do to bring life? Well, the first thing he does is he comes, he lives life, he dies on the cross, and he gets up from the grave so that death can be canceled. Which is why in 1 Corinthians 15 he says, O oh, death, where is your sting? Because it has been canceled in the resurrection of Jesus. So Jesus comes to abolish death and the works of the devil, and he he literally gets it out of the way. He cancels that death. But not only does he cancel the debt, he also does something positive. He grants life and brought life and immortality to light. Wow. Through the gospel. So in the gospel, we have the promise of both the abolishment of death and the arrival of life if we believe. So Jesus is in this business of granting that which is life indeed. I know I've quoted this to you several times, but I guess it's just been on my mind, right? John 11, what does he say to Mary and Martha, right? I am the resurrection and the life, right? This is where real life is found. Not in stuff, not in fun, not in pleasure, not in all the things that we chase, but only in Jesus. So if we believe in him... Death has been canceled, even if we should die in this life, yet shall we live because he has brought to, li brought to us life and immortality through the light of the gospel. But notice what does he say? It is in Christ Jesus. Right again, that Christ Jesus is about Jesus' position as the Messiah who came according to God's promise to give us what we needed. And of course, he is a very real person, a very real man that was both God and man in one. And he died on the cross and got up from the grave. But it says, in him, in Christ Jesus. This is equivalent to what John says. Jesus says in John, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father but through me. I know we rehearse this quite a bit, but it bears repeating often because we are filled, in a world filled with messages that say you can have redemption in some other way. It doesn't matter which religion you believe in, just believe in one. It doesn't even matter if you have a religion, just believe that you're going to go to heaven and you will. Friend, this is not the gospel. The light of the gospel that brings immortality and life is that Jesus is the only 
way. Jesus is the only way. So it's found in Christ and Christ alone. So, Jesus has promised life that is beyond this present world, but he's also provided a family that is beyond this present world. Because what does he say? To Timothy, my beloved son. See, God creates and sustains meaningful relationships within his body. Right? Jesus said this, Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. So shared biology, it's important, right? Our family is important. We are called to take care of our biological family. But shared union with Christ and his people is preeminent. Because the blood of Christ is thicker than the blood of biology. So we must be people who find within this body deep and meaningful relationships. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not automatic. It's not like you just come to church and then, bam, everybody's your, your friend, right? It takes time and cultivation. But this is why coming to church, one of the reasons why coming to church is so important, because coming to church is the means by which we are made brothers and sisters in an experiential way, because presence and work are required for relationships to be significant. Activity and service together is usually part of the means that we do this. Encouragement and correction is often needed. This is one of the reasons why we're pushing these discipleship groups to you because we want you to have a space and an area where these relationships are really formed and cultivated because without that, you can come to church, you can learn a lot of things, but you will not be connected to the life of this body. One of the great uh, testimonies that always get said about Lakewood is how friendly it is, how welcoming people are. And so what we want to do is capitalize on that gift from the Spirit and ride it deeper so that people come and they're not just, oh, well, this is a nice place, but this is a place where I am treated like family because that's what we are, right? So we must do the things that are required so that we can really exemplify this because if Paul has a beloved son in Timothy then we also can have beloved family members here so significant is Paul and Timothy's relationship is that later in chapter 1 he's going to talk about the tears that Timothy cried when they parted last right that should be how it is with the church we have here really meaningful relationships that should we be parted, we feel the sting of loss. But also the promise of reunion. Because here's the great thing about the spiritual family of God. You can lose your physical family. As much as it pains me to say, there are people in my own family that I don't expect to see on the day of redemption. All of you who believe, we can never be lost to one another. Because Jesus holds us tightly. So when we say goodbye to a brother and sister who has gone before us in the Lord, it's merely that they sleep. Because they're going to get up, and we're going to get up, and we're going to be with Christ forever. So the family of God is the unbreakable bond of the presence of the Spirit secured by the blood of Christ according to the will of the Father. We are made one together. It is truly a family. One of the things I love most about Lakewood, and I got to hear it this morning, is that you all sing together. Because I think families do that sort of thing, right? They get together, they have fun, they sing, they rejoice. I'm so glad that God has built that here in this place. So Jesus, right, he provides a life beyond this one. He provides a family beyond the present world. And he provides or protects his, his people, his family, for the world to come. So one of the things that's going to become apparent as we go through 2 Timothy is that there are many who are turning away. As I said, Paul feels deserted. The times are difficult. He seems to be in a lean season. Perhaps even there are people who are leaving the church in droves. That feels sort of like our day and age, right? Where people are unwilling to hear the truth. They don't want to come to church. They won't want to do the things that God expects. 
Paul says, all who are in Asia have deserted me. Demas, as I said, has loved this present world. You can almost feel the pain as Paul writes this. So what does he do? He comforts himself by knowing that Timothy is sincere in his faith, but also that Christ is faithful no matter what, which means that we can endure. So as many turn away, we must endure. He's going to talk about this over and over. Chapter 2, verse 10, that he himself endures with the eternal glory in view. Or if we endure, we will also reign with him. Later on in chapter 2, the Lord's servant must patiently endure evil at the end of chapter 2. In chapter 3, he says, continue as you have learned. Some, in chapter 4, will not endure sound teaching, but you endure suffering. So this is his theme. Which is why when he comes to the end, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. That is the utter testimony that we should have as believers. But enduring is easier if we do it together. Which is why we are in this family. Now many will also peddle lies. But we're called to speak truth in grace. In fact, throughout chapter 2... In the first part of chapter 3, he's going to talk about these who are doing the same kind of things as before, but they are particularly denying the resurrection of Jesus in some particular way. But perhaps most important is in chapter 3, it says that those are, there are some who enter into households and captivate weak women. So it's almost as if the false teachers in 1 Timothy have transitioned to a new method. They were standing up in the front and saying, don't do this, do this, right? God says this, even though they don't know any of the things that God actually says. So perhaps Timothy has actually done his work and has cleaned up the leadership of the church. And so what now, they, now what are they doing? They're going about slinking about, trying to spread it in polite conversation. They don't mount the pulpit, but they come off and, and do it in the pews. In fact, it's sometimes the case that there is more false teaching in the pews than there is in the pulpit because it's a lot harder to control what happens out there. Now, I don't mean that you're doing bad things, but this is what I do mean. I fear that you get more, I know, I don't fear, I know you get more messages every week through your Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram feeds than you do from me. Which is saying something, because I don't preach short. But think about this. You come and you listen to me at maximum two and a half, three hours a week. Do you know how much time most people spend throughout the rest of the week ingesting television, internet, social media, podcasts? 90 hours. 90 hours. In fact, uh, there's a, I'm going to read a couple quotes to you from an uh, article that Brett McCracken published a, a little while ago. It says, The church is increasingly just one voice among many speaking into a Christian's life. A church's worship habits may occupy two hours of a Christian's week, but podcasts, radio shows, cable news, social media, streaming entertainment, and other forms of media account for upwards of 90 hours a week. COVID-19 has further accelerated the already troubling tendency of Christians being shaped more by online life and its partisan ideological ecosystem than by the church life and its formal formational practices. In quarantine, Christians have been driven yet further into a fully online experience, drinking from the often toxic well of internet discourse in ways that poison their souls, largely devoid of the meaningful immersion in Christian formative practices. Christians are instead being formed in whatever online echo chamber they call home. Now I know we're not in pandemic anymore. Habits are hard to break, friend. How much time do you spend watching TV, looking at your phone? I know mine's a lot. And it's easy, it's easy to just float into those areas without really having intentionality. Now, the answer is don't retreat, it's to replace. Replace the truth or the lie with the truth. And we have a standard of truth. He talks about that in chapter 3, right? All scripture is breathed out by God. Chapter 4, preach the word. The key is get the word into you by getting into the word so that when you speak and think and interact that you have the truth of God guarding your heart. Because this is the mark of the true servant of Christ. Be 
diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. This is the goal. So many will live for themselves and for the moment, but we must keep Christ in view. Christian endurance is built on Christian hope, living now in light of our final rescue because this life will end, this age will end. Jesus will return. This is wonderful news for those of us who know Christ and terrible news for those who don't because Jesus is coming, as chapter 4 says, as the righteous judge who will judge the living and the dead, which means we better get right now. So I want to end with these four questions. The first is this. Where is your life? And what I mean is, is your hope for life in the promise of, that is in Jesus, or are you living your life as if it's all in the here and now? Because we, as the scripture says, are merely pilgrims in this world. Number two, what is your authority? Is your authority the word of God, the deposit that is guarded in your heart by the Spirit? Or are you following your own desires and the messages of the world? It says Jesus Christ is Lord, right? That is a claim to absolute authority. Number three, who is your community? Where are you finding meaningful, informative relationships? Because it needs to be in this place. Now, I'm not saying you don't need to have friends at work or anything like that. If this is really our family, then this better be where we find the most important community. And number four, what is your focus? Is it getting all that you can for yourself in the here and now? Or is it guarding the deposit that God has entrusted to us and giving it to others? Are we living in light of the promise of life in Christ Jesus? Or are we living as if this life is all that there is? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a second. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, then find that life today. Jesus came as we sang, as we read, as we preached. Because he loved you to give himself for you. To pay your debt of sin. To die in your place. To rise from the grave that you might have life everlasting. All you must do, friend, is repent and believe. Repent of your sin, call it what it is, acknowledge your need, and say, Jesus, I trust you and you alone because there's no other thing, no other place, no other way to find redemption. Maybe you're here today, friend, and you need to be a part of a family where you can find real, meaningful relationships that help your Christian walk, not hinder it. This is your place. You cannot come here and go unnoticed. Be a part. Or maybe you're here today and the Lord is speaking to you in a way that I don't know. But his word has pricked your heart. Friend, listen to the Spirit. Do not quench him. Do not deny. Do not walk away if the Lord is speaking to you. Father, we trust that your Spirit is here working in our hearts so that we might be made different to glorify you, to guard that which you have entrusted to us, to go and tell everyone about it. Lord, I pray that you will use your spirit to bring conviction, to bring comfort, to bring hope, so that we can live well in a world gone crazy. Lord, we ask that you will help us to follow you with faithfulness and endurance, so that you might be glorified in all that we say and do. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. If you will, please stand and sing with us. Dr. Kramer and Candace, if you'll come down, we'll be down here for you at the front if you'd like to speak with us. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things. Above all wisdom and all the way.
above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth. Here's the way to measure what you're If I lay behind the stone, you live to die, rejected and alone like a rose, trampled on the ground. You took the fall and thought of me above. All. Let's sing crucified again. Here we go. And crucified, laid behind the stone, you live to die, rejected and alone like a rose, trampled on the ground. You took the fall and thought of me. Amen. Well, I pray that you were encouraged and convicted and challenged today uh, by the word that Pastor brought for us. Let us read the Great Commission together uh, before we dismiss. It says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. Well, you are dismissed. May the Lord bless you and keep you. His face shine upon you and stay dry out there.